So, Connor, we're going to start at the beginning. Yep. Paint me a picture of your childhood, your family, your home. Um, mum and dad. My mum's a primary school teacher. Um, uh, young kids, like four years old. Um, my dad is a gardener. And uh, I've got two brothers, an older brother and a younger brother. There's about a year or two between us, like age gap. Um, from Liverpool, just outside Liverpool North, uh, a place called Ormskirk, or, well, near Ormskirk. I say that because most people don't know where I actually live, but uh, Ormskirk's the closest place. Um, yeah, childhood, fun, enjoyed it. A lot of time outdoors, in the garden, or out, you know, near the beach. Um, you can see green fields in, from your yeah, childhood home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So out the back window, there's a field. Um, where we are is quite rural. It's, uh, there's a lot of farmland around us, things like that. So uh, nature was part of your childhood? Yeah, big time, really big. Um, like I said, spent a lot of time outdoors, uh, a lot of time doing sports as well. That's what I thought I was going to be when I grew up. Um, I thought I was going to be a swimmer, funnily enough. Were you uh, any good at it? Yeah, <laughs> that's what I thought I was going to be a swimmer when I grew up. Uh, that didn't end up happening. That sort of stopped when I was 16. I got back injury. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, childhood, I look back really fondly on it. And your swimming, was that, um, were you a cold cold water swimmer or was it always in competitive? It was always competitive, yeah. I don't like cold water, <laughs> funnily enough, which is weird because I spend a lot of time sailing in it. But um, yeah, uh, it was competitive swimming. Yeah. Well, we'll move on to that later because that competitive instinct is something that, you know, is clearly a, a, a driver and a power, a, yeah, a, a so. power to your character. But um, you're, you have a really interesting career um, because you bridge two worlds. And firstly, it's with a camera. Describe to me the moment when you felt some kind of connection with this tool that has become so much part of your identity. Yeah, I guess the first sort of connection I, I had with a camera was, I guess, going back to when I first sort of started photographing music um, when I was 15 or 16. The way, there's a way I got into photography was basically there was a concert I really wanted to go to. Um, I'm a massive music fan, massive live music fan, always have been even as a teenager, but um, I didn't really have a job at the time and there was a concert I really wanted to go to and it, it was sold out. So I figured out a way to get into the concert would be by sort of trying to figure out if I could get a press pass for it. And I just got a camera for Christmas, a very, very basic like SLR camera, like the most basic model you can have, like kit lens on it. Um, but obviously I thought it was like, oh, this is the best camera ever sort of thing, but hardly used it to be honest. Stayed in its box for probably about a year or so. Um, besides the odd like family party, whatever, I'd bring it out thinking I'm a photographer. And then, uh, but this concert came and it was one of my favorite bands at the time. It was an English rock band called The Subways. And uh, their concert was sold out. And for some reason, I still to this day don't know what made me think of doing it, but I tried to find the band members' actual MySpace pages and message them to see if I could get a press pass for, for the show. Because I knew that would be a way in. And I messaged them some sort of message, probably being like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, it will help me with my art GCSE sort of thing, which it wouldn't because my teachers were very classic art, like paint this, draw that sort of thing. It was like photography is not like a, really, that much of an art form. Um, and amazingly, the, the bassist of the band, she's called Charlotte, she messaged me back and was like about a week or so later, a few days before the gig. And she was like, oh, here's our band manager's emails. Tell them I've sent you, like, we'll put you down for a press pass. And I was like, cool, like I'm in. I, I didn't really, wasn't really bothered about taking the photos. I was like, I've got into the concert for free. This is amazing. And then went to the show and with the press pass, it's normally like first three songs in the pit, no flash. And then you've got to get out. And, but I managed to stay in for the show. But uh, halfway through that first song, this is how little I knew about photography. I was like, oh, automatic mode, I'll just, that'll do it. Like the camera's decent enough. It'll halfway through the first song, I'm flicking through the photos and they're all like blurry or whatever. And I'm like, oh my God, what is going on? I was like, pop it into manual mode and try and figure it out there and then I managed to get like a few shots, which they end up using on their MySpace page. And I was like, this is awesome. Like, I want to be able to do this. This is cool. I wonder if, at the time, I didn't even realize it could be a job. It was more just like a, a, a like a hobby to do instead of, you know, at that time, like people in my school, they were all going out to parties and stuff. I wasn't bothered by that. And I was like, I'd love to be able to figure out a way if I can do this, like 
as a thing. And but you were generous because you took that, you took those images. You were opportunistic. You yeah. found your you found your chink of light. Mm -hmm. um, you then um, were generous, which I think is a really important facet of your character and your career thereafter by sharing those images. And, yeah. and I think that has been quite a critical part of your success, hasn't it? Is that you haven't stood on ceremony and grandeur. You've, you've, you've kept a, a kind of human element to all your, all your work. Would you, would you agree with that? I mean, there's I none so. of the yeah. grandstanding. No, you. I mean, all I do is take pictures. <laughs> like there's nothing to, you know, make Well, let's me... expand on that. Cause you don't just take pictures from there. <laughs> You went on into a career in the entertainment industry. Just just describe how it went from that gig to a few major names. Yeah, so I guess after that first show, um, I got back and I was like, this is awesome. I want to do this more. So I was, I'd be in school instead of doing my classwork or on the computer, like looking through the schedule of whoever's playing in Liverpool, like around that, you know, over the next month. And then it's, it almost became like, sort of like a game where I would scour the internet for a contact for these bands playing. You know, I'd find like a PR person or manager or band member and just email everyone and anyone. And I'd send probably like 100 emails a day to multiple different people, get two replies if I was lucky. One would be no, the other would be like, oh, maybe we'll think about it. And I'd just keep on looking back at the emails. Now I'm like, can't believe I'd sent, I'd sent some, like, I must not like harassing people, but like, any, anyone to do with this band, you know, it could be like hair and makeup, it could be stylist, it was anyone just to put me in, in the right sort of, help me connect with this person to get that press pass. Describe the really big break. I guess the big, the big break was probably um, my first tour. I, I, my first tour, I worked with a guy called James Morrison, UK singer. Um, that for me was my first insight into touring life, you know, going on a tour bus, um, traveling around the country, um, and then from that, I ended up like meeting a bunch of other people who I ended up touring with, uh, like Ellie Goldin, um, of, like just bigger names, you know, bigger venues, like end up doing arenas or stadiums or festivals, start traveling around Europe, start going into like America, South America, things like that. Um, another big break, I started working with Calvin Harris, who I still work with today. I've been working with him now for like six years. Um, he's one of my like really good friends. I get to travel everywhere with him. And, what do you think the qualities are in you that that makes that level of celebrity and power? That's what they have. Mm. Trust you and believe in you. Uh, I think I'm. I, I think it's just I'm quite an unassuming kind of guy. I'm kind of you know I'm not like I'm. I'm only there to take pictures. You know what I mean? I'm not. Don't have an ego. Don't have you know this sort of. Oh, you know, I'm, you know, oh, look at what I'm doing, kind of thing. It's more just like I'm, I'm there to be a fly on the wall. I don't want them to see me. I want to capture these like natural moments with these people, and I think the best way to do that is just sort of blend into the shadows and kind of be there and just, just be like, I guess, a nice person to be around. You know, if, if these people are traveling with you day in, day out for months on end, you, you don't want to be someone that they don't like because you've got to be likable and approachable to these people as well. So. I mean, I find it very interesting because we're talking today about uh, about the explorer mindset, mm -hmm. the, 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 the qualities of courage and resilience and boldness and all of those. And you, you flip that through acts of empathy and, and I, I, I think you, generosity as well, where you're letting other, you're letting things happen for you to record them. And, um, that is quite, that's a very different way of looking at the, um, the business of exploration, if you like. Yeah. Do you think that gives you more, a, a different eye, a different, a different perspective? I think so. I think as well, like, I guess the resilience as well is a, is a side of things that I, I'd never really thought about until you just said it then. But, um, I guess, you know, like I was talking about it the other day to someone, uh, uh, my career, and it's like. They were like, God, I would have given up if after the amount of people that said no to you in the in the start, like how how have you managed to, how did you manage to stick with it? And it was I guess it was just a thing I really wanted to do and really was like believed in that. I, I believed in myself a lot to that I was like, I can do this and it's kind of stuck with it, even though there was countless people saying no and shutting me down. Okay, so your career with the music industry, you get a voice, you get a you get you get noticed, you get an audience, and you get you get influence. Mm -hmm. Um and then you shift 
to run a parallel line and we'll talk about how they converge into yeah. this expedition universe. Mm -hmm. Describe to me the shift, when it happened and how. Um, I guess, I mean, it wasn't like a sudden shift. Like I said, like I've always been sort of interested in it. I, I never really thought I'd be able to do some of the things I've done, like especially like up in the Arctic region. Like to me growing up, that was unreachable. Like, I, I, you know, people like me don't be able, oh, can't do things like I can't go on expeditions. You know, I used to see people on TV, like CBBC News or News Round or something like that. And it'd be like, oh, this polar explorer. And they'd interview him and, you know, very sort of old, old blokey, you know, very prim proper posh accent. And that, that to me was very unachievable. Is that the right word? Unachievable? Is that a word? Unob it's totally unobtainable, I guess. Yeah. As as a as a you know a kid growing up in Liverpool, um, but the shift sort of happened, I guess, probably six or seven years ago when I started to get more sort of opportunities. I guess because of the people I was around and people sort of you know and social media as well. Um, I traveling on tour and stuff. I'd always find days off to go and do something, you know, whether it be, a, you know, go off somewhere in, in nature or go and try and find a few things in, in certain countries and things like that. And then through that, through posting photos of that, you know, people like WWF get involved and, and a few things like that. But what was the first, what was the first actual trip where you really felt the connect and the, 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 the future path? Uh, I guess I did a, I did a trip in, in Norway. Um, it was more sort of like a fun, fun thing with, with Ellie Golden, funnily enough. Um, one of my friends, we uh, we met a guy backstage at a show in Norway, and um, a friend of Ellie's introduced us. And there's a guy called Inga Solheim. He's a polar explorer, um, really really fun, like Norwegian guy. But he's not just a polar explorer; he's a sustainability king, isn't he? I mean, he he does it right up there. Yeah, I mean, in he's a, like a he's a way. yeah yeah. And uh, I met him backstage and. I basically, I was like, oh, well, like, what do you do? And he's like, oh, you know, I'd, I'd do this, do that. And I'd, you know, I'd guide people up to like the North Pole, South Pole, blah, blah. I was like, hang on, what? Like, that is the coolest job I've ever heard. Like, how do you? And he was like, oh, if you ever want to come on a trip, just let me know. And I was like, don't say that because I will 100% take you up on it. And uh, a few months go by and I got a message out of the blue from him. He's like, hey, I'm heading up to Svalbard um, for like a week or so before I go off to the North Pole. But I've got, you know, a week in between. Do you want to, do you want to like, come and explore Svalbard with me. I was like, 100% yes. Um, so I guess that was the first trip where I was like, okay, this is this is actually something I, I can actually do, I guess. Uh, so I went up to Svalbard for a week, hoping to see polar bears. Didn't see any polar bears that time, but I think that drew, drew me even closer in. Yeah, I mean, that's your first time in a seriously remote environment? I guess so, yeah, yeah. How did it get, what was the epiphany? What was the connection? Um, I think it was just the, um, my life, up, like even still now, but like go on tour. It's like I have a tour manager tell me where to be, what to do, what time to do, like where where I've got to be. It's like you've got to be here, there. We're flying there. This flight's here. We're going here the next day. As soon as I got there, it was just like boom. Okay, clarity. You know, in my head, there was silence. It was just it was just like pristine, fresh air. It was it was so different because I'd just come off tour as well, and I think it was that sort of. Almost, almost relaxation, even though it wasn't. It wasn't a relaxed trip at all. Um, but I think it was just that, it was literally polar opposites to what I'd just been doing. And I think that just really drew me into it. And I was like, okay, I can do this when I'm not on tour. Now I can see how your parallel lines, because to be clear, you still have a huge career in the, in the, music, in the music side of yeah. photography. And then you have this other uh, very significant career with, um, as a as a major, um, you're a major influence. I'm not going to use the word influence because I think yeah. it diminishes your power. Um, but as a major influence in, um, with your WWF ambassador, um, tell us the story about a piece of plastic that you photographed that ended up in somewhere. Oh yeah, fairly um, significant. So that was I was on an expedition about two or three years ago, four years ago, called Arctic Mission. We were attempting to be the first people to sail to the North Pole in a non icebreaker yacht. And um, there's 10 people on two yachts and we didn't get there, but we got the furthest north anyone's ever been in a, in a non-icebreaker. I, th I think it was. Yeah. Um, this was the Penhado. Yeah. And uh, when we were there, I remember spotting something in the ice and I was like, what's that? And it was a piece of like styrofoam and I didn't really think that much about it. 
Um, but we, we got it out the ice and photographed it. And then and the next day we found even more pieces dotted around on, on like ice flows. So I jumped off the boat onto one of the ice flows, photographed a piece that was just, just there. The wind must have blown it on or something. And again, didn't, didn't think much about it, but you know, I thought, uh, you know, this isn't a good thing, post it online. And then a, f a few months later, I get a, a tweet from someone who works for the US government. And it's like, oh, Conor McVie photos at the US Senate on a talk about, you know, climate change and plastic pollution. And I was like, hang on, what? So it ended up in, U in the US Senate on a talk about climate change. I was like, how, how has that happened? And that's when I first realized that that sort of stuff I was doing in those regions could help influence change. I want to ask you, because you have a unique access to celebrity culture, are you noticing any shift at the top in the way yeah, that they behave like that? Massively, especially in the last like few years, it's it's almost become like like cool to be conscious about it. You know, it's it's sort of like before then it was kind of not many people really spoke about it. It's kind of like a t taboo subject. I guess it's a bit like voting at the minute. Um, you know, there's a lot of people talking about that because they've realised now it's you know it's not that like taboo to talk about it. It's it's almost like cool to talk about it. Um, so it's definitely been a, a massive change in the last few years, for sure. Um, you had just recently, you um, describe um, your your meeting with um, David Attenborough. Yeah, I get another one of my heroes, you know, I've grown up watching his shows, hearing his voice on everything to do with nature almost, I guess. Um, I think most people have, to be honest, he is the voice of nature for a lot of people. Um, but I've been extremely lucky to have been working with him for probably about Past, first met him three years ago. Um, the first time I met him was out in Kenya in the Maasai Mara. I was on a trip for WWF. Um, and he was out there filming for Our Planet, the series that came out on Netflix last year, and also doing a few bits for his most recent documentary, which just came out, A Life on Our Planet. So got to go out and got invited behind the scenes on it. Got to photograph him out there in Kenya, um, and be on safari with him for a couple of days, which is like, the absolute dream. So um, your first ever safari? Yeah, was with David. I mean, I... Well, in the same car? Yeah, so traveling with him and, and stuff and, and, you know, getting to hang out with him. Um, it was next level. And also, like, getting to hang out with the, the crew who film these shows as well. You know, it's um, a guy called Johnny Hughes and, and Gavin Thurston, who both worked with Sir David for, you know, 30-odd years. Like, Gavin's the camera guy and another absolute legend um, in, his, in their own right. And... Uh, even getting to meet them and hear their stories as well as the David's, it was it was like the absolute jackpot, you know. Uh, but yeah, first safari with David Attenborough. I mean, any safari from then is it's been good, but I don't think any any other safari is going to come close to that. Yeah, no, kind of extraordinary. Um, he um has produced uh, one of the most important pieces of journalism. Yeah. In in the last year, mm -hmm. and um, he calls it his witness statement. Yeah. Um. What do you think yours is going to be? I think it's the way to create change is by changing people's behavior. And I think if I can do that through my work, then then that would be, I guess, my witness statement. Where have you not been that you most ache to visit? One place um, at the top of the list that I really, really want to go to, and that is uh, Antarctica. I've not had the chance to go yet. Uh, been close maybe to a few chances of, of going, but I've just the opportunity hasn't arisen yet. I'm sure it will, hopefully, and manifest it or something. But uh, yeah, Antarctica's the, the top of the list.